Picture the Roman Empire at its peak. Around the 2nd century AD, it was a true superpower, a giant stretching from the rainy hills of Scotland all the way to the deserts of Syria. Imagine this, 70 million people, a fifth of the entire world's population, all living under one rule. A merchant could travel from Spain to Egypt using a single currency, on safe, paved roads, without ever crossing a hostile border. This was the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. It was an economic marvel. But behind the magnificent marble buildings and triumphal arches, a serious problem was brewing. Rome's economy had a fatal flaw. It was addicted to conquest, and its emperors often treated the treasury like their own personal piggy bank. When the expansion stopped, the flow of new wealth from conquered lands dried up. But the spending, that didn't stop. What happened next is a powerful history lesson. A story of how debasing currency, runaway inflation, and reckless spending can bring even the mightiest empire crashing down. To truly grasp how Rome fell, we first need to understand the incredible economic engine they built. The Roman economy was mostly agricultural, but it was powered by a surprisingly advanced financial system. The absolute heart of this system was a small silver coin, the denarius, first minted in the 3rd century BC. The denarius became the dollar of the ancient world. For centuries, it was trusted everywhere because it was sound money. Each coin contained about 4.5 grams of high-purity silver. Soldiers were paid in denarii, taxes were collected in them, and trade across the vast empire depended on them. This trust in the denarius fueled the world's first genuine common market. The Mediterranean, which they called our sea or Mare Nostrum, was safe from pirates, allowing different regions to specialize. Egypt became the breadbasket, producing massive amounts of grain. Spain was a powerhouse of silver mining and olive oil. Production. Far off Britain provided wool and connecting it all was an incredible network of infrastructure. The Romans built over 50,000 miles of high-quality roads, while their primary purpose was for moving legions quickly. These roads became the arteries of commerce. To pay for all this the army, the roads, the government, the empire collected taxes. In the early, prosperous days, the tax burden was relatively light, often just 1-3%, to but it had to be paid in hard currency, in those reliable silver denarii. Despite its impressive scale, the Roman economy was built on a shaky foundation with two critical weaknesses that would eventually lead to its collapse. The first major flaw was the plunder trap. Rome's economy was, in many ways, predatory. It relied on a constant stream of loot from newly conquered lands gold, silver, and enslaved people to balance its books. This was how they funded their massive projects and paid their soldiers. But what happens when the conquests stop? Under Emperor Hadrian in the second century, the empire reached its maximum size and stopped expanding. Suddenly, that firehose of free money was turned off. The state now had to survive on its own internal productivity, and it simply wasn't enough to cover its enormous expenses. The second fatal flaw was the slave economy. Slavery was widespread in Rome, providing a source of incredibly cheap labor. While this might seem like an economic advantage, in the long run, it was a curse. With an endless supply of cheap human labor, there was absolutely no incentive to innovate or develop labor-saving technology, it is. Fascinating to think that the Romans actually had the theoretical knowledge for steam power. They invented a device called the Aeolipoli, but they never industrialized. Why would you bother building a complex machine to do a job when you could just buy another person to do it? This led to severe technological stagnation. The Roman economy never evolved, never found new ways to create wealth and was stuck relying on old, unsustainable models. So, the new wealth from conquests dried up, and technology stagnated. But Rome's expenses? They just kept growing. And the single biggest expense, the one that truly bled the empire dry, was the military. By the late empire, Rome maintained a massive standing army of somewhere between 300, 0 and 500,000 men, stationed all along its vast frontiers. Just paying their regular salaries was a huge financial burden. But it got worse. There was the donative culture. Many emperors didn't inherit the throne. They seized it in military coups to secure their power and keep the loyalty of the army, especially the elite Praetorian Guard in Rome. They had to pay them massive bribes called donatives. This set a dangerous precedent. And then there was the ratchet effect. Once you gave the soldiers a pay raise or a big bonus, you could never, ever lower it. Trying to do so would almost certainly spark a rebellion and the soldiers would just find a new general to make emperor who promised them more money. So, as military expenses spiraled out of control, the state faced a massive budget deficit. 
They couldn't borrow money like modern governments do. There was no market for national debt. This left them with only two real options, raise taxes on the citizens or find a way to cheat. They chose to cheat, and that decision would set in motion the debasement of their currency, triggering an economic crisis that would last for centuries. It was the beginning of the end for the mighty denarius and, ultimately, for Rome itself. So how did the most powerful empire in history just disappear? It wasn't just barbarians at the gates. The real story, the one they don't always teach you, is a slow, agonizing economic death. It's a story of how a superpower was brought to its knees, not by the sword, but by something we still wrestle with today, inflation. And it all started with a single, fateful decision. This is the chapter of Rome's fall that should terrify us the most. The Great Debasement. Imagine the Roman government, overstretched and broke. They had bills to pay, armies to fund, but the silver in the treasury just wasn't enough. Then, in 64 AD, Emperor Nero had a brilliant idea. What if we melt down our pure silver coins, mix in some cheap copper, and then mint even asterisk more asterisk coins with the same face value? It looked like free money. He reduced the silver purity from a perfect 100% down to 90%. Problem solved, right? Wrong. He had just opened Pandora's box once that taboo was broken. It became an addiction for every emperor who followed. The philosopher King Marcus Aurelius, facing wars and plagues, dropped the silver content to 75%. A few decades later, Emperor Septimius Severus, whose motto was literally enrich the soldiers and scorn all other men, slashed it down to 50% to pay his armies. It was a slippery slope, and Rome was tumbling down it at full speed. By the middle of the 3rd century, the situation was a complete joke. The once proud silver denarius was now just a bronze coin with a thin silver coating that would literally rub off in your hand. By the year 270, the coin contained a pathetic 0.02% silver. It was worthless scrap metal. And what happens when money becomes worthless? Prices go through the roof. Hyperinflation hit the empire like a tidal wave. Traders and shopkeepers weren't stupid. They knew the coins were junk so they demanded more and more of them for the exact same goods. Let me give you an example. In the second century, a measure of wheat cost about half a denarius. By the year 335, that same measure of wheat cost over 6,000 denarii. Think about that. The life savings of the entire Roman middle class, the shopkeepers, the artisans, the clerks, all of it, held in cash, was wiped out. It evaporated into thin air. Meanwhile, the super-wealthy elite who owned land and gold were largely protected. The economic glue holding the empire together had dissolved. This economic implosion led directly to a period known as the crisis of the 3rd century. It was 50 years of pure chaos. Between 235 and 284 AD, Rome saw almost 50 different emperors, most of whom were murdered by their own troops or rivals. With this constant political turmoil, who would risk starting a business or investing for the future? No one dot the sophisticated trade networks that had been the envy of the world just disintegrated. A merchant in Gaul wouldn't sell his wine to a buyer in Rome because he had zero trust in the currency he'd be paid with. The economy went backwards. People returned to a primitive barter system. It got so bad that the government had to start paying soldiers in actual food and clothing because the soldiers themselves refused to accept the worthless official coins. Into 84 AD, a tough soldier emperor named Diocletian seized power. He saw the chaos and decided to fix it with an iron fist and extreme government control. In 301 AD, he issued his infamous edict on maximum prices. This decrease set a legal price cap on over a thousand goods and services. He even threatened death to anyone who dared to sell something for more than the legal limit. What do you think happened? It was a catastrophic failure. Merchants just stopped selling things. If they couldn't sell their goods for a profit, why sell it all? Black markets sprung up but public markets vanished. Shortages got even worse. Diocletian learned a hard lesson that echoes through history. You cannot simply command value into existence, but the state still needed money. So, Diocletian and his successors unleashed a tax system so crushingly oppressive it basically destroyed the spirit of the Roman citizen. He created a class of local city councillors, the Curialis, and made them personally responsible for collecting the taxes in their district. If they couldn't collect the full amount, they had to pay the shortfall out of their own pockets. This completely wiped out the civic-minded middle class. To stop farmers from fleeing the tax collectors, the state made it illegal for them to leave their land. These people, known as the asterisk colony asterisk, became tied to the land they worked. The precursors to the medieval serfs, 
the idea of the free Roman citizen was dead. By the 5th century, the Western Roman Empire was just a hollow shell. The once great cities, the pride of Rome, had become traps of taxation, regulation, and starvation. So people fled. They ran from the cities to the countryside, seeking refuge with the wealthy elite on their fortified country estates, called villas. These villas became entirely self-sufficient little kingdoms. They grew their own food, made their own tools, and had their own private security, completely cutting themselves off from the failing imperial economy. This was the birth of feudalism. The central government in Rome lost its tax base, its authority, and its entire reason for being. So when the so-called barbarian tribes like the Visigoths and Vandals finally arrived, they didn't conquer a thriving empire. They walked into a rotting structure that had already collapsed from within. Rome wasn't murdered in a day. It was strangled, slowly, by decades of economic mismanagement. The destruction of sound money shattered the trust between the people and their government. Inflation wiped out the middle class. Crippling taxes crushed the poor. And the massive inequality left the average person with nothing left to fight for. When the final gates were kicked in, many Romans didn't even bother to resist. Why would they? For them, their empire had already died long ago. The lesson of Rome is a powerful one. A nation is only as strong as the trust its people have in its institutions, and that trust begins with its money. Thanks for watching. If you found this journey into the past interesting, be sure to like and subscribe for more stories from history.